This week, explosions, big taps, and goats on the loose. Welsh countryside, home to valleys, lakes, the odd feral goat, and Electric Mountain. Hidden inside this mountain is the Dinorwig Pumped Storage Power Station, and it is basically a monster battery. It stores energy by pumping water from this lake to a lake at the top of the mountain and then letting it flow back downhill, releasing that energy at times of peak demand. See, when you pop the kettle on during breaks in championship matches of that sport they call football, this bad boy springs into action to supplement our national grid, delivering power to our homes in under 12 seconds. It's an incredible view. It's one of the fastest responding power stations on the planet and we'll have a nosy inside the thing later in the programme. Denorwig offers a semi-renewable energy solution at a time when our natural resources are being used up. As solar, wind and tidal power alternatives advance, we're craving a method of using their generated energy 24-7 despite the weather or time of day. And this is where batteries come in. Now, this isn't your stereotypical battery. Admittedly, when I say battery, you probably think of the ones in these. These are rechargeable lithium ion batteries. And we really can't live without these. Lithium ion batteries have truly revolutionized electronics. They power the mobile miracles that we use every day. They have a high density, meaning they can store a lot of electricity relative to their small size, so we can easily carry them around and we can recharge them hundreds of times. Inside cells are layers of sheets stacked together, a positive cathode, negative anode, with a separator in between, filled with a liquid electrolyte. When a cell is discharged, the movement of ions from one side to the other facilitates the flow of electrons, which then generates current to power devices. During charging, this process is reversed. Whoever came up with this must have been a real genius. My name is John Bannister Goodenough, and when I was at Oxford, well, we developed the uh, cathodes that enabled the lithium ion battery that you use in your cell telephones and laptop computers. I didn't really think about whether the battery that we were developing would be a world famous invention. And uh, I've been very pleased to see how it's been developed in the hands of the engineers. It has stood the test of time, with electric vehicles today relying on thousands of lithium-ion cells for their battery pack modules. The dependence of modern society on fossil fuel energy is not sustainable. And so one of the things we need to do is to find a storage of electric power generated by alternative energy sources and also storage batteries that can power an electric vehicle in a competitive price and, and performance. It certainly sounds like Dr. Goodenough's invention has proved good enough for 37 years, but lithium ion isn't without its problems, and that's led some people to look for alternate battery technologies. And this summer, the UK government pledged a quarter of a billion pounds into the research and development of battery tech. At the forefront of this research is Warwick Manufacturing Group at the University of Warwick. Lithium-ion batteries do have potential hazards and if you, ma you mistreat some of the higher energy chemistries then yes you'll see a battery fire and potentially a, a rupture and so on. So there are titanate chemistries, what's called iron phosphate chemistries, which are a safe option for use in sort of public transport and so on. So as a, as a research centre, as a cell manufacturer, you can play tunes with the chemistry 
to basically decide whether safety is your prime goal or your prime criteria or whether performance and energy is. So if you look at your periodic table, all the transition metals that you see on there, generally somewhere in the world there's a scientist trying to make a battery out of one of those. So calcium batteries, aluminium batteries, lithium sulfur batteries, sodium ion batteries and so on. There's a whole range of different chemistries being worked on. So although we're working on lithium ion at the moment and we're persevering with lithium ion, there will probably be more developments in the future as we move into different types of chemistries. As the UK's leading automotive battery R&D centre, WMG works at the intersection between scientific research and industry, with the likes of Nissan and Jaguar Land Rover as close collaborators. Here is a module that we've developed and it represents about a 7 to 80% improvement on the Tesla battery module. Now, that improvement has come about not through changes in the chemistry, but changes in the way that the module has been constructed. So, packing the cells tighter together whilst maintaining safety, improved cooling systems, etc. At the moment, cost and range of new EVs and the number of charging points available to us is an issue. Manufacturers like Nissan even offer up a replacement diesel or petrol car for customers who need to drive longer distances as part of their promise scheme. As well as making batteries, WMG is also looking at how our charging behaviour can affect battery life to surprising results. It's made a smart algorithm which shows that degradation of a car battery can be reduced by up to 10% over a year if energy is transferred back to the grid. Synonymous with EVs is Tesla, owner of the world's biggest battery factory. Due to hit peak production in 2020, the Gigafactory aims to produce enough batteries to power half a million new electric cars every year. Tesla boss Elon Musk's ambitions go further than revolutionising our cars though. He wants to rewire our homes too. Enter the power wall. The 6,000 pound home battery stores energy gathered from solar panels during the day and when the sun goes down, sustainably powers your pad. It's pretty straightforward, really. It's like, <laughs> not that complicated. From Tesla to Ikea, there seems to be a growing trend in companies creating home batteries to harness solar power. So how exactly does this work? Tech enthusiast Terence has had solar panels for several years, more recently connecting them to a home battery, meaning he can use the power he generates and send excess back to the grid. The battery charged up 1.4 kilowatt hours, which it then used throughout the day, so that saved about 15% on energy bills. He's also using it to power his electric vehicle, and thanks to the way that feed-in tariffs currently work in the UK, he's being paid for the power he generates, even when he uses it. But of course, it is early days for the technology. I think one of the things that we're going to see over time is these batteries will become cheaper, they'll become smaller, and they'll also become higher capacity. At the moment, uh, this battery is two kilowatt hours, which is, is great, but it's not quite enough for, for everything that we want to do with it. Terence is actually taking part in a community trial taking place in the Rose Hill area of Oxford. Whilst the usual cost for the installation of solar powers and a Moixa battery would be £5,000, here the cost of batteries is subsidised and a network has been created, meaning power can be economically shared between the 82 homes, a school and a community centre that are taking part. My house generates more power than I can use, so why not store it? Why not sell it back to the grid? Uh, why not give it to my neighbours when we've got surplus? In this area where many are living in fuel poverty, the community element of the project seems to be appreciated too. And here at this school, they're also treating it as a learning experience. Here in this year six classroom, you can see the solar panels out of the window and here is the battery that's harnessing the power. Now this power is actually being used for the lighting in this room, but the whole setup also teaches the kids how this works. Swedish giant IKEA are now selling home batteries too, using the same premise of harnessing solar power and that providing electricity consumable by the homeowner. 
claiming the average UK home could cut up to £560 a year from their electricity bills. Meanwhile, British company Powervolt are working on giving old electric vehicle batteries a second life as home batteries. Whilst after eight to ten years of road use, a battery may have started to deteriorate, it seems that it could still be used in the home where demands are less strenuous, giving it an extra decade of use. After being taken from the vehicles, they're checked electrically, graded, reformatted and stacked together to create energy storage systems for the home. Of course, as battery costs come down and capability increases, the appeal should too. So whether this idea goes mainstream most likely depends on whether the sun shines over those figures. Welcome to the week in tech. Maintaining the battery thief, it was the week that panic was caused on the London Underground when a mobile battery pack exploded. The station had to be evacuated. And Mark Zuckerberg rejected claims by President Donald Trump that Facebook is biased and anti-Trump. Bill Gates admitted he's ditched his Microsoft phone for an Android handset. And the United Nations has declared robots could destabilise the world. It's opened a centre in The Hague to monitor developments in artificial intelligence. The skies are about to get busier as autonomous passenger drones move one step closer to reality. In Dubai, a test flight took place of a proposed autonomous flying taxi. Designed by German outfit Volocopter, 18 blades power the drone, with passengers selecting a destination via touchscreen. Meanwhile, a company called Passenger Drone released video of its self-flying drone testing in Europe. A human can also take the stick and take control of its 16 electric motors. Amazon's announced a host of new hardware this week, including new versions of its digital assistant, the Echo. The Echo Spot features a screen and can make video calls and act as a nursery camera. And the Echo Plus can act as a smart home hub, connecting to and controlling other devices. And finally, James Dyson of colourful, expensive vacuum cleaner fame announced plans to launch an electric car. Here's hoping it doesn't suck. Back at De Norwig, I'm heading deeper underground. The water comes from the lake, which is about 600 metres above us, down this pipe, hits this valve and stops. This is the biggest tap you will ever see. And there are actually six of them all in a row down there. When they need the power, this yellow arm swings up, the valve opens, and we get some maximum flow of water through to the turbines through there in about six seconds. When all six are open, that's 92,000 gallons per second. Or as it says here, one and a half million cups of tea. Oh my God. Not sure if that's Earl Grey or English breakfast, mine. Do we have flow? Do we have flow? We, ha we have flow. And there it is, turbine number two, spinning at about 500 RPM. And when all six of these turbines are all spinning, this place produces enough electricity to power the whole of Wales for five and a half hours. Now, De Norwig runs at about 75% efficiency because it pumps its water uphill at night using cheap electricity it buys from the national grid and charges a premium for the energy it generates during the day. If we were to move completely away from fossil fuel power stations, would that mean that this sort of power station wouldn't be able to run? In reality, yeah, if we need to pump that water up the hill, we've got to go and buy that electricity from the market somewhere, whether that is a thermal power station, a set of windmills, a gas power station, whatever it might be. Why are there not more of these around? I suppose the, the greatest challenge is finding a, a suitable place um, in the UK to build them. You know, you've seen yourself that you've got to have them in a specific area. It's got to have two lakes. The two lakes are ideally reasonably close together, good vertical separation. 
um, you know, they're not the kind of things that you can easily sort of build on the back of a wagon and, and, and wheel them in somewhere. It, it, you know, those lakes need to exist or you need to create them, so it comes with cost. So I, I think it's just a limited amount of options in terms of um, locations for such places. Yeah. Cool. You're a bit lonely down here. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Whilst this is powering our homes, Cat Hawkins has got some top tips to help power our phones. For a lot of us, we feel like we can't live without our smartphones. And so when the battery dies and we don't have access to power, it can be a massive inconvenience. Now, there are a number of easy things you can do to help save your battery. Dim your brightness, turn off Wi-Fi, GPS, and any background apps that you don't need to use. But there are a number of apps out there that are actually claiming to save your battery. Do they actually work? Greenify Battery Doctor and DU Battery Saver are three of the most popular battery saving Android apps. They've got millions of five star reviews on Google Play suggesting people think they work, so we thought they made a good testing ground. They claim to do a number of things from dimming your brightness to hibernating or optimising apps or reducing the data being used. So to start off, the team here took a brand spanking new Samsung Galaxy J3 and hotwired it. We have the voltage, the current and the power. So if we turn the phone on from idle, we can see that the current to the phone, the power to the phone increases. And then if we do something that's quite power hungry, so for example, taking a photo with the flash on, you see that the power spikes massively. Then they tested the phone baseline with no battery saver app installed and using a small amount of apps over a 10 minute period. And then they did the same with the battery savers installed as well as the inbuilt Android power saver, which comes installed on the phone. So what we can actually see is that the power savers do seem to work. They make a small difference for Battery Doctor and DU Battery Saver, about two or three hours by the looks of things. And then Greenify actually makes a difference of about four hours. So why do you think Greenify is doing better than the other two? We think that's because of the way the apps work. So DU Battery Saver and Battery Doctor, uh, they offer you an option to optimise the performance of your apps. So, we suspect what they'll be doing is you know, lowering the frequency with your apps contact mobile data, making them run less in the background, whereas Greenify offers a hibernation mode when you put your phone into idle. But interestingly, the most efficient seems to be the Android power saver, the one that actually comes on the phone when you get it from the factory. But this is currently a limited test of just 10 minutes and all conducted on the Wi-Fi. What needs to happen now is a much bigger test of hours at a time and using apps that stream videos, play games or use GPS. The team here haven't yet determined whether the apps do everything they say they do, but do think you can do many of the features yourself if you're organised enough. But most of us want to use our phones hassle-free, so the apps help with that underlying management. But there are other things you should do if you want your battery to have a long life. If you plug your phone in when you go to bed and it's charged after a couple of hours, that time at 100% charged overnight will significantly accelerate the degradation of the battery. Even better for your phone batteries, Life Max says, is to keep your phone charged between 20 and 80% at all times. So remember, that's 20 to 80. Thank you, Kat, but wouldn't it be nice to get to that 80% much faster? Cue a very different battery technology that can be charged really quickly. See, these things can deliver a lot of power very quickly and so they'd be much more useful in something that needs to do a lot all at once. Something like this. Instead of the electrochemical charging in normal batteries, this charges by electrostatic means. It's called a supercapacitor. No chemical reaction means you can charge very quickly. This drill battery, for example, goes from zero to full in 12 seconds. You can zap and go, which sounds like a pretty good name for a company, if you ask me. We use carbon nanomaterials, which are extremely fine particles at the nano level, and a large surface area is created inside one of these pouches that attracts energy very quickly. The more surface, the more energy you can attract. The downside of supercapacitors is that they can't store as much as lithium ion, so you wouldn't want one in a phone. They're best suited for things that need quick charging and big, short bursts of power, like tools and toys, like this scooter. Now, the lead-acid batteries in a normal electric scooter, like those ones, will give you about half an hour's ride time, but they'll take six hours to charge. In here, we've got a battery which only gives you six minutes of ride time, 
but only takes six minutes to charge. And the next generation will give you 12 minutes of ride time and it will still only take six minutes to charge. But with that kind of ride time, it's unlikely your electric car will run purely on this tech alone. Ultimately, of course, we're aiming to go into the automotive sector, possibly as a hybrid combination with lithium. So we do the fast charge bit and the lithium does the long distance bit. We'll take the charge in up the roadside and then we will transfer from the zap and go cells to the lithium the power that we've harvested quickly as it's on its journey. To that end, Zap and Go is working on a way to power airport pods like those at Heathrow. Unfortunately, however, my six minutes of ride time are up, so for the moment I'll have to leave Zap and Go and zip off by car. Back over in Texas, the father of the lithium-ion battery, Dr. Goodenough, shows no signs of slowing down. He's working on a new type of battery with a surprising chemical makeup an all-glass, solid-state battery. A lady by the name of Elena Braga brought to me a glass, which is a remarkable material. I think we've come up with a cell which will really do the trick. Together with his colleague, Dr. Braga, Goodenough claims the new non-flammable battery will last longer and recharge quicker. It's a very competitive field and I I'm a competitor, <laughs> so I'm hoping that the, the new glass that we've done will enable us to go from a liquid electrolyte to a solid electrolyte that will make things safe as well as cheap. Lengthening the lifespan of batteries is obviously one of the main aims of researchers worldwide, which could be why a team at Bristol University say they've designed a new type that can last thousands of years. They've created a man-made diamond that, when placed inside a radioactive field, generates a small amount of current. Whilst the radiation it gives off is less than a banana, there are no moving parts involved, no emissions generated and no maintenance required, just direct electricity generation. As well as making use of nuclear waste, their invention could theoretically power devices in places that people can't go. But whilst this could be years away, something hoping to charge onto shelves sooner is the Prieto battery. The battery has a different architecture to the standard lithium-ion battery. It has a 3D sponge-like material which is coated in a cathode slurry. It's non-toxic, explosion-proof and promises to store more power. My ultimate dream was to make a really outstanding battery that ideally would let device designers be more ambitious in terms of new kinds of devices, uh, but also ideally to solve some problems in terms of renewable energy, being able to store um, intermittent types of energy like solar and wind. There are other concepts out there too, such as microbial fuel cells that use anything from saliva to urine to drive electricity production. At the end of the day, the batteries we're so passionate about using still rely on finite raw materials taken from Mother Nature to work, and not enough are considered valuable enough to be recycled. Which is why WMG is working to not only extend the life of its car batteries, but figure out a system to give them a happy retirement too. Before then, I guess the best we can do is try and make sure the fuel we use doesn't have a lasting impact on our environment. Well, that's it from the Denorwig power station in North Wales. What a privilege it's been to visit such an unusual place. Don't forget, we live on Facebook and on Twitter at BBC Click. Feel free to get in touch anytime if that is you have enough battery. See ya.